mics are ready going there. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. So as we go there, I uh, just want to make a reminder to the people that may be watching the video. Uh, we're at 950 West Arch Street in Polk Township. Uh, if you've been watching uh, the services on a regular basis and you'd like to come out and join us, we start at 1030. Uh, we'd love to have you. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. The will of God, part 8 of 489. Today's title of the message is Fulfilled <coughs> Promises. Fulfilled Promises. Who did Christ die for? Us. We'll see in a moment if he died for us or not. Who did Christ die for? But before we get in there, let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. For this cause, we also, Paul says this cause meaning uh, the faith and love of the uh, Colossian church and believers, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So, as I've said for eight weeks now, the will of God is inexhaustible. That's why it's part eight of 489. So, we can continue on. But Paul here is praying for these believers that they be filled with his will, God's will, and, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And that's what we've been doing here. We've been praying for one another that we all be filled with God's will and we have that understanding. So we're going to continue to do that. And that's why we're starting here. We'll probably be here for the next 481 weeks. So with that in mind, turn to Romans chapter 9, page 974. Last week, we looked at these verses, and that they're still on the board here, Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5, the privileges and benefits and blessings of the nation of Israel. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. Did I see the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Ghost, bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I wish, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. So Paul's saying here, he'd be willing to give up his own salvation for my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul was willing, he's saying, if they would come to the knowledge of truth, he'd give up his own salvation. Verse 4 and 5, he says, Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, who are the fathers, of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God bless forever. Amen. Last week we went through these verses. And we see that these blessings, these privileges and benefits are to the nation of Israel. And as we went down through, we see that the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, who are the fathers concerning the flesh, Christ came. And then we looked into Romans chapter 15 verse 8 that Jesus Christ was a minister to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises of the fathers so that these things that we see these benefits here in Romans chapter 9 is why Jesus Christ came to earth to confirm the promises to the fathers to the, who? To the Israelites that these promises we see the covenants the law, the services, 
They weren't to us, were they? But to whom? The nation of Israel. Ephesians chapter 2, page 1009. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision, in the flesh made by hands. Verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Okay. So these promises and benefits and blessings we've seen in Romans chapter 9 were to the nation of Israel, correct? And that we know through Scripture that Jesus Christ was a minister to the circumcision. And the circumcision in the Bible are the nation of Israel. We looked at that in Genesis chapter 17. That God made a covenant with Abraham. That on the eighth day, okay, there would be circumcision. That's how God identifies, would identify the nation of Israel, by the flesh. That Jesus Christ came to confirm these promises. Now, what was our relationship to these covenants and promises and services and the glory, the adoption? What was our relationship? We had none. Okay? We had none. So, that was my question. Who did Jesus die for? Us. We always say us, okay? We all say us. But Lord willing, by the end of the service today, we'll see something a little bit different. Okay? Ultimately, yes, Christ came to die for the world for the sins of the world. Christ came into this world to save sinners, which, by the way, we all are. We just happen to be saved by the grace of God. That's the only difference between us and unbelievers. We're saved by the grace of God. But He came into the world to save sinners. But who did He come for first? Okay? That's what we need to see. And that's what I want us to see today. Who did Christ die for initially? Ultimately, it's for us. But initially, I don't think it was. And hopefully we can bring that out in Scripture today. So let's go to John. The Gospel of John, chapter 19, page 931. And we're going to drop in at verse 14. I know you guys are probably all familiar with these verses. This is the the context of it. Of course, is the, the death of Christ, the crucifixion. So John chapter 19, verse 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour, which was noontime. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him, therefore, unto, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. Verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him. Two other with him on either side. One, and excuse me, and Jesus in the midst. Verse 19. And Pilate wrote a title, put it on the crowd, on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read, Many of the Jews. For the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, in Latin. Those were the three common languages of the time. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said 
I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled. That the scripture might be fulfilled. Which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Okay, verse 24. They, they cast lots for the clothes of Jesus, right? Let's go back to Psalm 22. That's page 508. Keep your finger in John, okay? Psalm 22, verse 16. We remember here that the scripture might be fulfilled. Let's keep that in mind. So Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. That's the same thing Jesus said. Or they said at Jesus' crucifixion. That's what they did. See, the Psalms were prophetic, weren't they? Here, this is being fulfilled. Fulfilled prophecy that they would cast lots for the clothes of Jesus. That the Scripture might be Fulfill. Let's go back to John. Verse 25 in John chapter 19. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the, the, the disciple took her unto his own home. That was the Apostle John. Verse 28. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a set of vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar, and put it upon the hyssop, and put it into his mouth. When Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, let's turn back to Psalm 69. Psalm 69, that's page 529. Remember my question. Of whom did Jesus die? Whom did Jesus die? Psalm 69, verse 19. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I look for some to take pity but there was none. And for comforters, but found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Fulfill prophecy, isn't it? Okay? That the scripture might be fulfilled. Back to John chapter 19. Verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, 
for the Sabbath day was in high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first, and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and from with came there out of blood and water, and he saw that it bare record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. Verse 36. For these things were done that the scripture might that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Now when they if you're familiar with the crucifixion, when they crucified a person, they put him up on the cross, they crossed their legs in this manner. And what would happen, they they, they would die of suffocation because their bodies were punched. They wouldn't be able to breathe. So what they would try and do is stand up with their legs so they could catch their breath. That's why they broke their legs. Because then they would actually die of suffocation. But then when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. They didn't have to break his legs. So let's go back now and see this in Scripture. Go back to page 514 in Psalm 34, verse 20. Psalm 34, verse 20. And he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. So, again, fulfill prophecy, right? Back to John, verse 37. And again, another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they have pierced, Go to Zechariah, page 812. Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that shall come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for the firstborn. They shall look upon whom they have pierced. Now, that hasn't happened yet, has it? That's going to happen at the second coming. So this prophecy really hasn't been fulfilled yet. Even though they may have looked upon him on the cross, but more specific that this prophecy is going to be filled, fulfilled in the future, in the kingdom. But it was that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Okay? Are, are you with me on, on, on where I'm at here? Okay? The scriptures might be fulfilled. The death of Jesus Christ. Remember Romans 15, 8. That Jesus Christ was a minister of the boom, circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises of the fathers. And that in time past, what was our relationship with God? We had none. So when Jesus Christ was here on earth, who did he come here to minister to? The Jew. Even his death on the cross. Jesus' death on the cross was him confirming the promises of the fathers. Okay? Kind of a knock in the head, isn't it? Because then that answers my question. Whom did Jesus die for? He initially came to die for the nation of Israel, didn't he? Okay. We're going to bring this about. One thing we need to remember. These things that happened at the crucifixion, they weren't a secret, were they? Where were they revealed? 
in scriptures. They weren't a secret. They were foretold. And this is why Jesus came to earth, to confirm the promises of the fathers, which we had no relationship to. Okay, let's go to Luke now. Luke chapter 1, verse 67. And as we're going there, the context of the scripture here is Zacharias, the priest, and his wife Elizabeth. Okay, God had come to them, the angel of the Lord, and said that they were going to have a child. But Zacharias and Elizabeth were both very old. Zacharias didn't believe the angel of the Lord. So the angel of the Lord, uh, Scripture says that, uh, and behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not be able to speak. Okay, so, so God basically shut the mouth of the priest, Zacharias, that he wasn't able to speak. Okay? And the child that they were talking of that they would bear, that Elizabeth would bear, was John the Baptist. Okay? I just wanted to set that as we go through these scriptures. Now, when John the Baptist was to be born, they asked what his name should be. And they said, John. And the people there said, well, there's nobody of the of your kinsmen named John. And then they came to Zacharias again with the pad and he wrote down his name shall be John. And when he did that, his mouth was open. He was able to speak. Okay? And that, that's where we're at now. Zacharias is able to speak again. In verse 67, And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. The Lord God of Israel. Okay? Luke chapter 1, verse 68. I have to stop there. I want us to go back and see a couple of these verses back in the Old Testament. Again, in the Psalms. Go to Psalm 106, verse 48. 106, 48. Don't have the page. I will in a moment. Five forty-eight. Yes. Five forty-eight. And yeah, keep your finger in Luke. We're going back there. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord God of who? Israel. Turn to Psalm 41, which is page 518. 41.13. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, from everlasting and to everlasting. Amen. Okay. The Lord God of Israel. Here we see in Luke that same phrase. And blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Now, during Jesus' earthly ministry, so the point I want to try and bring out here is blessed be the Lord God of Israel. What was our relationship to Israel at this time? We didn't have any, did we? We didn't have any. We always have to keep that in mind. We didn't have any. So the question is, you know, who did Jesus die for? Okay. Verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has visited and redeemed His people and has raised up and horn of salvation for us in the house of of his servant David. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which has with hat which have been since the world began. Let's go to verse 71. That we, who's the we here? The nation of Israel, isn't it? That we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all that hate us. 
to perform the mercy promised to our fathers. Remember in Romans chapter 9? The, the, the blessings and the privileges were of the fathers, right? And to remember his holy covenant. What was our relation to these covenants? We had none. And the oath which we swear to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we be being, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him in all the days of our life. Okay. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Chapter 1. Verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Who were Jesus' people? The nation of Israel. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth the son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted God with us. See, I think we've seen, Lord willing, we have from the scriptures, it is quite clear that Jesus was a minister of the circumcision, okay, a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises of the fathers. Even the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was Jesus confirming the promises of the fathers. That Christ came to die for His people. And then we see it. The Lord God of who? Israel. What was our relationship to Jesus Christ during His earthly ministry? We had none. We had none. So, would He then in turn do you think that He would die for us? Or are we his people that we see here in Luke? That we see in Matthew? No. But he came to die for the nation of Israel. To confirm the promises of the fathers. Right? Let's go to John chapter 1. It's a big circle today. Okay? But we're a little over halfway done with the circle, okay, if you would. Because what I would do is bring this circle full circle. Okay, to use that phrase, bring it into full circle. We're on our upward swing of that circle, okay? See, the, the beginning of that circle, see these, these sledgehammers, okay? The beginning of the circle had to do with the sledgehammers. We have to break down the foundations of things that we were taught. Because my initial question was, who did Jesus die for? And you know, the natural answer is for us. Ultimately, he did. But initially, he did not. So we're on the upward swing of that circle. So please, bear with me, okay? Bear with me. We're on the upward swing. John chapter 1, verse 11. We know that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Verse 11 says, He came unto His own and His own what? Received Him not. Christ came to save His people from their sins. They rejected their Messiah. They rejected their Messiah. Okay. Let's go to Romans now. 
chapter 11. And we're on the upward circle here. Romans chapter 11, verse 7, which is page 909. Romans 11, verse 7. Oh, I'm sorry, 976, 909 was John 111. <coughs> Try to read that, bud. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, it's not that bad. I just read the wrong number there. <laughs> okay. Romans 11, verse 7. See, one day we get to the point where I can stop using those numbers, right? Okay. Amen. So, verse 7. What then? Israel had not obtained that which he seeketh for, which was righteousness, but the election had obtained it. We read verse 11 of John 1. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But then verse 12 says, but as many as received him, he gave to them power to become children of God. I'm going to paraphrase that a little bit. But there were some that believed Christ, but for the most part, what did they do? They rejected him, didn't they? So now here we see Paul talking about that and referring to those in John chapter 12, the little flock of Luke chapter 12. There was a small remnant of believers. When, when Jesus walked the earth, so there's a misconception about this. When Jesus walked the earth, there weren't a lot of people that trusted the Messiah. Remember in Acts, when they were in the upper room? How many people were in that upper room? 120. So I believe it's safe to say that in Jerusalem, now there may have been others scattered abroad, abroad, but in Jerusalem, during Jesus' earthly ministry, there was only 120 people that, as we say, got saved. Not a lot, is it? There's always been a remnant. Okay. And these are the ones that he's talking about here. The little flock are the ones that were saved. 120. Now let's continue in uh, Romans 7. It says, What then has hath Israel not obtained that which he seeketh for? But the election hath obtained it. And the rest were what? Blinded. They were blinded. The election, the election being the 120? The ones that got saved, yes. Mm -hmm. the, the believing... The believing Jews at that time, mm -hmm. the believers, were the election. We're the elect, aren't we? Because we put our faith in Christ. One day we're going to get into detail on that election and the uh, predestination and the foreknowledge of God. But he's talking about the Jews here, the ones that believed Jesus during his earthly ministry. But the rest were what? Blinded. In verse 9, And David saith, Verse 8, I'm sorry. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that should not see, ears that should not hear, unto this day. Paul's quoting from Isaiah 29. Verse 9. And David saith, Let their table be, let their table be made a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Now he's quoting uh, Psalm 69. See, Israel has been blinded in part. How do I know it's in part? Well, some believe, some didn't. But we're going to go over to verse 25. And let's look at verse 25 out of Romans. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. When? Until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Okay? That's us. The fullness of the Gentiles. So every believer that God, every Gentile that God plans on saving in this dispensation of grace is snatched away at the rapture. Then God's going to pick His program up with the nation of Israel again. But they're blinded in part. And that's what we see Paul saying here in Romans chapter 11 uh, verses 7, 8, and 9. They're blinded in heart. 
Let's read verse 26 of 11, of Romans 11. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. That's not till the future, is it? That is during the kingdom when that remnant of Israel will be saved. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them and I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. See, when God makes a promise, He doesn't change His mind, does He? God promised to save this remnant of Israel. He's going to do it one day. But that's not, that's not happening right now. God's prophecy program is put on hold until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Until we're raptured out of here. Then He's going to pick up that program again. And let's go to verse 30 now. For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Okay. We're halfway up on that circle now, aren't we? Remember, Jesus came to confirm the promises of the fathers. Even that death on the cross was Him confirming the promises to the nation of Israel. And He came to give them repentance and to die for their sins. To give them forgiveness. Not us. Because what was our relationship? We had none. But because of His mercy and their unbelief, okay, and nothing we've done, nothing we've done as Gentiles, but because of their unbelief, God has set them aside and now, let's go back to Romans 11, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. For to provoke them to jealousy. Do you see it? Because of Israel's unbelief, Salvation now has come to the Gentiles. Salvation in time past was of the Jew. Our relationship to the nation of Israel were aliens and foreigners from these covenants and promises. Now salvation is coming to us because of Israel's unbelief. Acts 28. Page 976. Oops, oh, I'm sorry. 967. 24, or 2824. See, it goes back to the question. Who did Jesus die for? <coughs> Ultimately, us. Initially, the nation of Israel. And because of their unbelief, salvation has now come to the Gentiles. Verse 24. And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. Things haven't changed, have they? <laughs> and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing, you shall hear, and shall not understand. Seeing, seeing, you shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. And it should be, and should be converted, and I shall heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that salvation, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. And they will hear it. God has set the nation of Israel aside. All these promises 
that we've seen in Romans chapter 9, the privileges, the benefits, and the blessings that were to the nation of Israel are on hold. Why? Because of their unbelief. Their unbelief. God has set the nation of Israel aside, that prophetic program. When we looked in John chapter 19, everything that happened on that day of the crucifixion was prophesied about, wasn't it? It was no secret. It was no secret. Turn with me. Ephesians, again. Page 1009, chapter 2. Pages, uh, verses 11 and 12. Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles, in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision, in the flesh made by hands, and at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That was even at the crucifixion of the cross, wasn't it? Jesus came to confirm the promises of the fathers. Now, verse 13, and you guys know I enjoy doing this, but now, but now, in Christ Jesus, ye, who sometimes were far off or made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and had broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That's the law. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself twain, which is two, twain one new man. That's the body of Christ. That's us. Verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you and were and which were afar off, and to them that were not. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. Remember like we were in verse 12? We were foreigners and strangers, having no relationship to God. But now, after the cross, <coughs> we are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. So do we see the difference? But now, after the cross, see, now that cross applies to us, doesn't it? Because we're no longer strangers and foreigners. But we are now, as verse 19 says, we're fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God. In time past, it was the Lord God of who? Israel. We were without God having no hope, right? Let's look let's look now what the scripture says after the cross. And after God has set the nation of Israel aside because of their unbelief. Let's turn and let's go to Romans chapter 3, page 970. Romans chapter 3, verse 29. The Apostle Paul pens, Is he the God of the Jews only? We did see verses that said the Lord God of Israel, didn't we? And if we had no relationship to God, is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith, that's the Jew, and the uncircumcision through faith. Do you see it? It's by faith now. Okay, that he's not only the God of the Jew, 
but he's also the God of the Gentile. Okay? Romans, chapter 10, a couple pages to the right. Verse 12. It says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, that's the Gentile, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. See, now there's no difference, is there, between Jew and Gentile. I've always said that today, in this dispensation of grace, we're on the same level playing field. We're fellow citizens with the saints now because of their what? Unbelief. That salvation is gone. The salvation of God has gone to the Gentile to make the nation of Israel jealous. They've been blinded in part till the fullness of the Gentile come in. See, that death of Christ on the cross was no secret. And we've seen that in Scripture. He was, Jesus, was the minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises of the fathers. He came at His death was confirming the promises of the fathers. He came unto His own. His own received Him not. And because of their unbelief, the salvation of God has now come to us Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. He's the God of both the Jew and the Gentile. The God of both. Now we have that relationship with Him. We no longer have enmity, but we have peace with God through the cross. So, go ahead, Bill. Could the uh, atheists of today be created with all the old time Israel? Well, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you know, people that claim to be a, uh, an atheist, I think it has no, no distinction between whether it be old time Israel or what you're saying here. No, so. I mean, their beliefs. That, you know, well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that question. Well, atheism, you know, atheism is. They course. just believe there's no God. Right. And so, uh, yeah. Israel was basically the same way, I guess. Well, Israel believed there was a God, but the Lord God of who? Lord God of Israel. What they rejected, they didn't reject. See, the to use that phrase now of the Israel of old, Israel doesn't reject God. Who do they reject? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Okay? That was verse 11. Now we go up to verse 1 of John. Okay? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. See? And then the, when this Word, in verse 14 of John, the Word became flesh. See, who they reject, Bill, is not the Lord God of Israel, but they reject their Messiah, who came to confirm the promises of their fathers. See, they don't reject Israel, but the God of Israel, they reject their Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that's who they're rejecting. And to this day, the majority, okay, because Israel, in part, has been blinded. Okay? You know, they don't reject, now I understand what you're saying, they don't reject God of these Old Testament Scriptures, but they reject Christ being the minister to the circumcision to confirm these promises. See, that's who they reject. And who do most people today reject as well? Jesus Christ. Okay. It's Christ who they reject. Because our, I, I talked to a couple this week, and I put it to them this way. Most, we, we, we live in a merit system, okay? Even, you think about this, even with our dogs, I use it with the dog. If our dog goes out and does their duty, what do we do? We give our dog a treat, right? Uh, now we come into our, our children and our grandchildren. Our ch children do something good, what do we do? We give them a snack, okay? Uh, we go to work. What does our boss give us? A paycheck. Okay? See, we live in that merit system where we have to earn something. If we don't do something, we don't get 
a good English email. We don't get nothing. We don't get nothing. Okay? But you see you see see our system, our, our world system. If you don't do anything, you don't get anything in return. And that's the hardest thing for our world to accept. Because our world today has no problem accepting that I have to do something for my salvation. The world has no problem with that. Works, 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 works. I'm going to work to the day I die to, gain, or to earn my salvation. And they have no problem with that. But when we preach the gospel of their salvation, that it's a free gift, Okay? That they're justified freely by the grace of God. It's the redemption of Jesus Christ. The finished work of Christ. And it's a free gift. Our world can't handle that. There's nothing free in this world. But there is, isn't there? It's salvation. And that's what Christ came to give. But first he came to give it to who? To Israel. But because of their unbelief, God has set them aside. It has now brought the salvation of God to us. And I don't need them notes anymore. Okay? Think about it now. We're in this Easter, okay, celebration. And as you guys get to know me a little bit more, a little better, uh, holidays aren't really my favorite time of year because the world has just saturated with saturated these holidays with paganism okay paganism easter is a pagan holiday okay we worship the resurrection and that's why for us today that's why i brought this message as we call palm sunday okay i didn't bring a traditional palm sunday message but this is for us a preparation for next week the resurrection okay and that's what the Holy Week, as they call it, and Palm Sunday really was the preparation week of Christ going to the cross. So this is our preparation Sunday, if you would. That Christ came <coughs> to die for the nation of Israel, His people, to save His people from their sins. They rejected Him. And because of God's mercy, He's now given salvation to us. we should be overwhelmed. Because remember, in Ephesians, what was our relationship to God? We had nothing. God didn't send Jesus really to this earth to save us in this room. I know it flies in the face of, of, of teaching. Ultimately, He did. Okay? Christ came to save His people. But because of their unbelief, salvation has now come to us Gentiles. We should be overwhelmed with joy that because of God's mercy we can now be saved. We can now partake of these promises. We can now partake of the forgiveness of sins. We now who dwells within us? The Holy Spirit. God. Okay? That's a promise that wasn't given to the nation of Israel. Uh, well, they had eternal life. Yes. Okay? But the forgiveness of sins. That's going to be future, isn't it? We have forgiveness of sins. We've been translated into the kingdom. We've been justified. We've been redeemed. We've been glorified. We've been sanctified. That's what I want us to understand on this preparation Sunday, if you would. Okay? And to know that now salvation has come to us Gentiles. And we should really appreciate what we have. We need to appreciate it more. The church, the body of Christ does not appreciate that gospel. Because if the church as a whole, the body of Christ, appreciated the gospel, we'd be telling more people about it. On average, 2% of Christians, use that word like Christians, share their faith on a regular basis. Why? One, I don't think they understand the ramifications of the cross and how it applies to us <clears throat> and how fortunate we are today in this dispensation of grace which in time past was a secret wasn't it he did God but now is manifested to his saints that's us 
and that we should make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. This is a joyous time for us, but we need to have a grasp of it. Okay? Yes, Christ came to die for the sins of the world, ultimately. But initially, he came to save his people. His people rejected him. Now he's come to us. Salvation has gone to the Gentiles. The salvation of God has gone to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Not that we should cast away Israel, as we've seen, that Israel will be saved one day, but not till the future. They've been blinded in part to the fullness of the Gentiles. So I want us to have a, a better grasp of our own salvation and how fortunate we are in this dispensation of grace. We live in the best time ever. This is the best time to be alive. Another degree, I mean, we talk about the fullness of the Gentiles. We live in a time that by the time I'm done speaking here, or by the time we're done with our three hours of uh, In Your Heart Rings a Melody and get that down pat, we could be raptured. That's joyous. We live in that time frame. There's nothing hindering Christ for coming back for us and snatching us out of here and meeting Him in the clouds. That could happen today. But now, do you see the, the excitement of those two words? But now, but now, ye who are in Christ are brought nigh by the blood of Christ. That's for us today. So let's go out and tell people about the gospel and their salvation. And let them know how joyous we are to be children of God. That they can be children of God too. To stop working. If a person says to you, what do I have to do to go to heaven? Don't, don't be afraid. Just tell them, stop working. Stop working. That's what I told this couple during the week. Stop working. Stop working and believe. Just believe. It's by simple faith. Taking God at His word. If God sent forth His Son to be a propitiation, that faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that have passed through the forbearance of God. God satisfied with the redemptive work of Christ. So the question is, are you? Father, we thank You for the redemptive work of Christ. We thank You that our sins are forgiven. Father, we thank You for this uh, dispensation of the grace of God that we live in. Father, help us understand our salvation. Thank you, Lord, that we are so, uh, to use those words, fortunate, Father, to be able to partake of your salvation. And Father, it's because of the unbelief of Israel. And Father, help us get that message out to these uh, Jewish people, Lord, that this Jesus Christ is their Messiah. And they need to put their faith in his death, burial, and resurrection. <clears throat> and Father, I pray that we all have done that as well. Father, help us appreciate the work of the cross that we may go tell others. And we thank you. In Christ's name, amen. amen.